Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at our last section of Chapter 8, which deals of, with strengths of covalent bonds. And this is actually a thermal chemistry idea. This is another way to estimate the delta H of a reaction with a little bit simpler situations and a much, much, much simpler table of information uh, than what we did in Chapter 5 with uh, uh, our formation enthalpies in Hess's law and so forth. So to start with, the strength of a bond is measured by determining how much energy is required to break the bond. So when we're talking about bond strength, we basically measure the amount of energy it takes to break it, and we're going to call it the bond enthalpy. Now bond enthalpy for Cl to Cl bond, which is written as DCl dash Cl, is measured to be 242 kilojoules per mole. Notice it has a per mole amount. So what we're saying is if we break a mole of Cl2, it would take 242 kilojoules of energy. So they're listed as per mole amounts and their bond enthalpy is how much energy it takes to break. Now this table, and this is table 8.4 from the book, so when you're doing your calculations you're going to use this table uh, from the book on page 326. Um, and this table really is a list of average bond enthalpies for many different types of bond. And with a relatively small table we have a huge number of types of compounds we can actually calculate enthalpies of. So that's much simpler than our formation enthalpies tables. Now this is the average bond enthalpy and you'll notice that these are all positive numbers. That's because bond breaking is endothermic. How much energy does it take to break a bond? Well from the bond's point of view, the system's point of view, we have to put energy in. That's an endothermic situation. And that's going to create an issue with math we're going to have to look at here. But there's a, we have a simple way of looking at this. But technically, all of these bond enthalpies for our single and multiple bonds listed here would be positive values because we're talking about how much energy it takes to break a mole of those kinds of bonds. Now, one thing to note here, these are average bond enthalpies, not absolute bond enthalpies. And that's because if you have C to H, well, we could have C to H in methane and we could have C to H in CHCl3. Well, technically, because we have different things inside our molecule, the actual amount of energy it's going to take to break the bonds is going to vary based upon what else is there. So when you see this number for C to H, it's basically an average number for the different types of C to Hs that can exist in different types of compounds. So it's an average bond enthalpy. So in other words, what we're really doing here is we're estimating enthalpies. Now, yes, the accuracy is fairly close. Notice these numbers all go to one decimal place. Uh, but there are some uncertainties here that are a little bit larger than our formation enthalpies. So a lot of times we'll refer to this as, you know, estimating delta H for reaction. But it is a quick, easy way with a very short table to get very, very similar numbers to what we did back in Chapter 5. So if you take a look at a typical reaction here, we're going to look at the bond enthalpies um, before and after the reaction and use that to determine what the total amount of energy is. Now we're starting by breaking some bonds from what we used to have, and then we end by making some new bonds. And the way we do the math for this is this simple equation. The sum of the bond enthalpies that are broken minus the sum of the bond, or yes, the bond enthalpies that are broken minus the sum of the bond enthalpies that are formed. So if you take a quick look at what that would imply, bond enthalpies of what's broken. Well, what's broken, those are things on the reactant side. What's made, those are things on the product side. So technically, this superficially looks like what we're doing is reactants minus products. That doesn't make any sense. Don't we always do final minus initial products minus reactants? Well, the answer is yes. That's because we're not really doing pro our reactants minus products. The whole reactants minus products idea is a way to simplify the concept when we're pulling numbers off the table. You'll see why on the next page. So we're not really doing delta E is reactants minus products. What we're actually doing is we're adding up all of the energies involved in breaking and adding up all the energies involved in producing. Now remember, these are endothermic. It takes energy to break. So these should be exothermic. It should release energy when we make. Well, when we look up numbers from the book, everything in the table is for bond breaking. They're all endothermic positive numbers. So one way to simplify this is basically add up all the reactants that get uh, broken, add up all the products that get made, and just do reactants minus products technically it's adding the two together and we're supposed to multiply the products by negative one but it's quicker just to say reactants minus products 
So since bond forming should always be exothermic, we should really be adding the negative of the products to the reactants. But it's simpler just to say some of the reactants minus the sum of the products. Now in this particular reaction, if you look, we've got CH4, which looks like this in its Lewis structure. And we've got Cl2, which looks like this. And what we're technically doing is we're breaking one of these hydrogens off and we're breaking these Cl's. And this Cl comes in there and this H and goes there. And that's what's happening. We have one C to H bond breaking and one C to Cl bond breaking. And we have one C to Cl bond being formed and one H to Cl bond being formed. So if we look up the numbers from the table in your book, we would see that the C to H that gets broken is 413. The C to Cl, or Cl to Cl, is 242. And then on our product side, we're forming one C to Cl, that's 328. And we're forming one H to Cl, that's 431. So when we add them together, we get 655 and 759. Remember, it's technically supposed to be the adding the opposite of 759. But it's quicker just to say 655 minus 759 is negative 104 kilojoules. So when this reaction happens, we would release, when one mole reacts with one mole to make one mole and one mole, we would release 104 kilojoules of energy. Now, when you go to do bond enthalpies, Here's some help on what you're really going to do here. Now, first of all, you'll see how on the previous page, it was much easier to see what was happening if we drew the Lewis structures. So basically, draw your Lewis structures because it makes it easier to see what's being formed and what's being broken. Because sometimes it's hidden until you see the Lewis structure. Next, to simplify, what we're going to do is multiply the number of each bond times its bond energy. We're not going to worry about what actually was broken and what actually was made. Just Make them all, break them all is the easy way to look at this. So we're just going to count the total number of bonds on each side. And yes, we do a tiny bit of extra math in this, but it really does simplify the process if we just count the total number of bonds and multiply by the number on each side. And then don't forget we total reactants products and then we take reactants minus products. So here's a typical reaction. Now on the surface, when you look at this, it looks like, okay, I've got two reactants and I've got two products. So this is the kind of calculation I should be doing here. Well, once you draw the Lewis dot structures, because that's really the first thing, draw your Lewis structure, because it's easy to see what's going on. You can clearly see that we have <coughs> C to H bonds, we have C to C bonds, and we have O double bond O bonds. We need a third on our reactant side here, because we really have three different bonds that are being broken. Now on the product side, we have a C double bond O, and we have an O single bond H. So that's what's happening over there. We really do only have two. Now, to simplify this, rather than try and figure out you know, exactly how many were being broken and exactly how many were being made, we're just going to make them all and break them all. It makes it a lot easier. So first of all, we're going to look at breaking all of them. Don't forget we have two of these and seven of those and four of these and six of those. Those coefficients become really important when we're totaling our numbers. And remember, easiest way to do this is don't split hairs. Just look at how much energy it would take to break all of them and how much energy it would take to make all of them, and that will give us our delta H. So first off, we look at the number of bonds and times their bond enthalpy. Well, we have a C to H bond, we have a C to C bond, and we have an O double bond O bond. So let's count up the totals here. I'm going to switch to blue for this. So C to H. If I count, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, doubled. I've got a total of 12 C to H bonds. And if I look it up on page 326, I see C to H is 413 kilojoules. Now, I look at my C to C bonds. Well, I just have one, and once again, doubled. So I've got two C to C bonds. On that page in your book, the C to C bond is 348 kilojoules. Then I do the same thing for O to O. Now on the table, it doesn't look like O to O exists, but there's an O2. And remember, what we're looking at here is O2. I have seven O2s. It's not 14 single bonds, it's seven double bonds I'm breaking. So I'm breaking seven O2s, and by that table, O2 is 495 kilojoules. So just multiply that out and get your numbers here. So in your calculator, 12 times 100, or 12 times 413 is going to equal 4,956, and then 2 times 348, 696, and then 7 times 495 is going to equal 
3,465. And all I need to do is just add them up. So try and break all of them. Look how much total energy is. And then do the same thing on the product side. On the product side, I have C double bond O bonds and O single bond H bonds. And if you count your numbers, I have 1, 2 times 4, so 8 C double bond O bonds. And if you look that up, C double bond O is 799 kilojoules. And then my O to H, I have 1, 2 times 6, 12. And when you look up your O to H bond, it's 463. So once again, just multiply it out. Don't worry about what actually was broken or made. Just multiply it out. 799 times 8 is 6,392 kilojoules. And 12 times 463 is 5,556 kilojoules. Now at this point, add them all up and take reactants minus products. It's much quicker and easier if you draw the Lewis dot and then break them all, make them all. It's a much easier way to calculate your delta H here. And you can clearly see that the product side number is bigger than the reactant side number. Well, that means it's going to be negative, which makes sense. We're combusting something. We're burning something. Energy should be released in this reaction. So that's how you go about doing a bond enthalpy. That's the easy way. Write the Lewis dot, break them all, make them all, and just do reactants minus products. That's all you do for bond enthalpies. Now, last idea from this section is the relationship between bond enthalpy and bond length. And this is something that you should have looked at in pre-AP and in class discussions. Sometimes this has already come up by this point. Now, when you look at the length of a bond, you'll notice from this table, when I go from single to double to triple, that the average bond length, when I get a multiple bond, seems to be getting shorter. And that holds up true in every single instance here. So in the next set, it's carbon to nitrogen, single bond, double bond, triple bond. You'll notice it's also getting shorter. Well, if we relate this to what was on the previous page, we can make a couple of different relationships here. As the number of bonds between two atoms increases, the bond length decreases. And that's a very, very true statement. So single bonds are longer than double bonds, and double bonds are longer than triple bonds. And remember, when we have resonance, like in the case of something like SO3, this would be one way to draw the resonance structure. Technically, what we have here is 1.33 bonds in each position. So if we looked at the bond length of this substance, we would find that it should be closer to the single bond length than the double bond length. And that's because it's one and a third bond order. So bond order is referring to how many bonds do you really have. Normally, it's one, two, or three. But in the case of resonance, we can have you know one and a half or one and a third, and so on. So as the number of bond between two atoms increases, the length decreases. Now, how does that relate to what we looked at before with energy? Well, here's a series of carbon. As the number of bonds increases, the bond length is decreasing, and the bond energy is increasing, which should make sense. We've got more energy bound in a triple bond situation than a double bond situation. Now, the very last thing we're going to look at here is a relationship between bond length and bond energy um, for a couple substances. So we go back to a diagram we started this chapter with here. So I want to finish out by going back to that very first thing we looked at. Now, on this diagram, we actually do have two things, the bond length and the bond energy. The bond length would be basically this distance right here. So that's our optimum bond distance. Any closer? the increase in repulsions is going to push it back apart any farther away and the greater attractive force is going to pull it back close together so it ends up at this bond length right here so it's 75 picometers for an h to h bond and what would be the bond energy well that would be this distance right here 435 kilojoules per mole so that's the relationship between the diagram we looked at at the very very beginning of this chapter and what we've just been discussing now Another relationship here to kind of test what we looked at on that last idea, and this is a concept I've seen expressed this way in the AP test. So if this is a diagram that represents C to C, so now we're going to pretend, I know it was H to H, but we're going to pretend it's C to C. So pretend that this says C here. 
And it's going to ask us, you know, what, how would this diagram change if we had a C to C double bond? Well, think about what the ideas were we just looked at. If we have a double bond, then the bond length should be shorter. So my low point should be farther over here to the left. So I should have a smaller bond length if I've got a C to C double bond. And the second idea would be, well, how about the energy? Remember, the energy was less for a single bond, greater for a double bond. So if I was looking at a C double on C situation, I would expect this to go down lower and the lowest point to be over here farther to the left than it would before. So this should be more like what a C double bond C would look like. It should have a greater bond energy and it should have a smaller bond distance. And that ends our ideas from Chapter 8.